Jama'een. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, upon his family and his companions and those who follow them until the end of time. Uh, first of all, to everyone, uh, assalamu alaikum. Shalom. before we get started, I want to thank Mac and this city of Toronto and the citizens of Canada for organizing and putting on such an incredible event. And also our signer who's signing for our community, alhamdulillah, making sure that they're part of this important event as well as we want to welcome uh, everyone to this evening's uh, talk, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq wa sadad. May Allah make it easy for us and give us guidance. So the topic that I was given is pretty vast, you know. It's a lot of things to capture sort of in a, in a short talk, so I'll do my best. But I think it's very important that we locate the importance of peace of mind and the role of being sort of in a, a place where our minds are clear and our minds are at least distanced from things that may be creating trauma or bothering us. And one of the things I've noticed in working in my own life, uh, as well as with young people and old people, is that oftentimes people have not addressed, for example, childhood trauma, or trauma that may have they may have experienced within religious communities. And when that stays unaddressed, it impacts their relationship with faith. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the reason, excuse me, that it impacts their relationship with faith is because it impacts their ability to sort of engage in a holistic cognition, to engage in like a holistic relationship with, with Islam. Islam is vast. It's a lot. So I think the first thing that we should think about is pushing into healing. I lost my father, you know, three weeks ago. Maybe you don't know. It's, it's not easy, like, when these things happen. Uh, we're not the same for a long time. And it's okay, we're human beings. We're not perfect. We, we believe about the prophets in our theology that prophets can experience normal human emotions. Al-Marzuqi, Al-Mariki, and I'll translate for you. He says, He says in this famous poem, Aqidatul Awam, that the prophets, we believe, they experience human, normal human experiences as long as it doesn't compromise their role as prophets. If that's the case of the prophets, alayhim salam, what about us? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was hurt by the murder of his uncle, Sayyidah Hamza. He was uh, upset at the loss of his son, Sayyidina Ibrahim. He wept, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the early part of the Prophet's life is not a romantic story. It's a story of trauma. He loses his father, he loses his mother, he loses his grandfather, he loses his wife, he loses his uncle. One of the years in Mecca is called the year of sadness. We honor that period as a time of incredible sadness for the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he loses his city. So in many ways, the, the early part of the Prophet's time on earth and then continuing into his time as a prophet is not how to manage the utopic. It's about managing and shouldering through tremendous tests and challenges. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran teaches us the importance of being emotionally, physically, and intellectually healed. We'll never be perfect. The dunya is built to cause problems. This is not Jannah. But we see, for example, in the Quran, and I don't want to make it too technical, al qarh, the qira'ah of Hafs and Asim, that says they were in, impacted by qarh. Qarh is an existential suffering. But the other qira'ah from Sayyidina Shu'ba, from Asim also, it says qurh. Qur is emotional suffering. So you have two qira'ah for one verse, and this is the beauty of the qira'at, that they are, they are, you know, 
helping in a way us understand broader things. That's why Ibn Jazari says about the Qiraat that one of the blessings of the Qiraat is that they will, the different recitations of the Quran, they will keep you busy with the Quran for your whole life, subhanAllah. So you'll spend your life in the service of the Book of Allah. But this one verse, these two Qiraat teaches us something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was concerned about the existential pain and suffering of the fledgling community of the Prophet, but also their emotional pain and their psychological pain. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam as policy, he would do things to not only address physical pain, but also psychological pain, like changing the name of Medina from Yathrib to Medina because the name has a history. I saw this in Los Angeles, they changed the name of South Central because they said the name is associated with like psychological and emotional suffering. We saw this in America after the murder of George Floyd, when people were asking that relics and statues built to honor white supremacy and the antebellum South and slavery should be brought down because they are triggers of legitimate emotional concern. You saw this here in Canada now with the original inhabitants of this land who are triggered by certain things psychologically. So we see now even governments reacting to engage policy that not only impacts people physically, but impacts them emotionally. The Prophet, peace be upon him, in Imam Madik narrates that when the Prophet came into Mecca after he returned to Mecca, and he said to Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, if it wasn't that these people just became Muslim, I will order the Kaaba to be destroyed and rebuilt on the foundations of Ibrahim. Here we see the illa, the reason that he doesn't destroy the Kaaba, it's going to create, this is a, an icon to these people. This is something that will move them in ways that will cause emotional instability and may lead to strife. So there are countless evidences. You know, Imam al-Ghazari says about healing in Manhaj al-Abidin, that healing is not just your spiritual healing, your emotional healing, or your physical healing, but it encompasses all of those aspects of your life. So when we talk about having clarity, and obviously sometimes tests force us to have clarity, but ideally we want to push into addressing things that may be disturbing us. We see this in marriages, we see this in relationships with our children. If there's bad blood, as we say, it's very difficult to like heal and scale the relationship. So how do we heal? Number one, we, we should understand that tests are from Allah's justice. We know that good and evil are both from Allah. Allah created all things. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, qul kullum min indi Allah. Everything is from Allah, the Quran says. And we see in the Quran that people experience good and bad times. And we understand that good is an opportunity for gratitude and difficulty and evil is an opportunity for resilience. And this is the edifice of what it means to be Muslim. Because we know that the command of Allah and the decree of Allah can contradict each other. And this is where sometimes Muslims get confused and they be start to get exposed that they haven't studied theology. Often what I find with Muslims is they imagine what Islam is. So even their response is, that's not my Islam. Well, it's not your Islam. It's Allah's Islam. But when my imagination is informing what I think Islam is, then I should be able to ask myself, what is the source of that imagination? And largely, it's going to be sources which are not Sharia compliant. So my, my thoughts of Islam may be skewed and off. So one of them that I find a lot that exposes Muslims is when you say to them, Qada Allah can dis differ with the Amr of Allah, the decree of Allah, can differ than his command. They say, what, how can you say that? Astaghfirullah. Because suddenly they became Christian in theology or Jewish in theology or Hindu in theology or Buddhist in theology or their favorite rapper in theology or their favorite athlete in theology or their favorite video game or enemy character in theology. Because what's empty will not be able to provide you something. So if the knowledge isn't there, 
illa amaniya wa inhum illa yadhunnun. It's in the Quran. Allah says, the problem with those people who followed Sayyidina Musa is they imagined what their religion was. They didn't learn what their religion was. So one of the great foundational principles of Islam in our theology is that the command of Allah can differ from the decree of Allah. For example, Allah commanded everyone to pray, but He decreed some people won't pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded people to believe. He decreed that Abu Lahab will be kafir. And it's at that moment, at that moment that if I am not whole, as best I can be, because none of us will ever be completely whole till we enter paradise, that I will not have the capacity to choose the command of Allah and I will become a moral relativist. Well, you know, sometimes you talk to young Muslims and they say, I went to Islamic school and the kids were worse than the public school. So I said, well, this is what Allah gave me, so I became bad. That's the decree of Allah. But the command of Allah is to be good. So the, the fundamental test that we want to talk about here quickly is that when the entire world is presenting itself in the most vicious ways and unjust ways and evil ways, the Muslim is the one who che chooses the command of Allah over what Allah has decreed. When his Lord said, submit, Ibrahim submitted. And if you think about what I said, this is actual tasawwuf. Not the strange, non-political, silent, just take it on the chin tasawwuf. Tasawwuf teaches us ihsan. And ihsan is to worship Allah as though you see Him, even though you can't see Him, you know He sees you. What does it mean? Because we can't see Allah. It means that at the moment that contradiction happens, I'm a good Muslim. Why is Allah putting this in front of me? I'm a good Muslim. This test is happening. My marriage is struggling. My kids are going crazy. My neighbor's at Dajjal. Whatever. My brother, he has two neighbors. He calls one Fox News, the other BLM. And they just fight each other all the time. And he's in the middle. But the point is, at that moment when the world is presenting itself to you through evil, you choose the command even though you don't see the one who commanded you. And that's ihsan. That's the height of ihsan. So in the face of injustice and moral bankruptcy, which is rampant and accepted in society, I choose the command of Allah. I worship Allah as though I see Him even though I can't see Him. And that's what it means to be blinded by the dunya. I'm so blinded by the dunya, I can't see the amr, the khitab. In order to do that, the third component is my cusp, my choice that Allah has given me. Oftentimes people ask me, if Allah knows I'm going to hell or heaven, why should I act? Because He knows you're going to hell or heaven. This is not a complicated answer. If someone told you I'm from the local zoo and there's a lion in that room, you shouldn't go in there. You won't say, well, because you know I should go. Because you know I'm going to use that against you. No, I should trust knowledge. I should trust Allah's infinite knowledge who says, act and do righteousness. So the third component of that is my choice. In order to make the right choice, I need to be trying to work on my healing. And I need to take time to invest in myself, whether professionally or otherwise. But for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Quran, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءُ وَرَحْمَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ he says, Shifa'un, Nakira. The Quran is a complete healing. It doesn't mean you don't go to the doctor. That's a shallow, reductive reading of the Quran. But it means for the issues of doubt and desires. The Quran's major medicine is going to focus on three or four things. Number one, education in the face of ignorance. Number two, confidence in the face of insecurity. Number three, yaqeen in the face of doubt. And number four, the akhirah in the face of desires. These are the four things that the Quran works on to remedy. Knowledge of Allah. Knowledge of Islam. When people come to me and they say, I saw some person on TikTok and you know what? My iman is just not right. Why are you taking your iman from some non-Muslim guy on TikTok? Like that's not where you go to take iman. 
You won't take kunafa from a white guy selling poutine. So why would you take Iman from some non-Muslim hater on TikTok? You know, I'm just like so rocked by it. So what I tell people is, but are you rocked by the positive message of the Quran? They say, no, that's the problem. So the first is I should take my doubts to the book of Allah. And I should understand that when I read the Quran, it will challenge me. It's not just a book that's going to pat you on the back. It's a book that's going to demand you make change. It's a book that's going to demand I live responsibly. Al-Quran hujjatun lak aw alayk. The second is when I come to the Quran with insecurities, because at times it may feel difficult being a Muslim. The Quran will remind me, kam min fi'atin qalila gharabat fi'atan kathiratan bi'idnillah. How many times did a small group defeat a big group? It's not about how much, but how the quality. The second, the third is my doubts that I have. You know, the Quran starts. And you have to be patient in this process. Don't, it's not like you're ordering, you know, fast food, man. It will take time to have that relationship. And then the fourth, when I have my desires, there is not a page of the Quran except the Akhirah is not mentioned, subhanAllah. Almost every page of the Qur'an, the hereafter is mentioned. Because we tend to forget in the face of Sephora and losing Kawaii and all of the things that could happen to us and not getting the new Assassin's Creed, which is a total disaster, or not getting the Tesla or losing jobs or having very serious challenges. We may lose our focus on the hereafter, the perspective of the hereafter. So as a mercy and as a healing, the Qur'an allows us to locate the dunya where it should be. That's, it's the means to the akhirah. It's not the akhirah. And that's why subhanallah, almost every page, Maliki yawmiddin wa bil akhirati hum yuqinun wa lahum adabun alimun wa quduha al-nasu wa al-hijara wa bashir al I'm going through every page of the Quran now, in the beginning, akhirah, 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 akhirah. One of our teachers said, when people begin to see the akhirah as the bidaya, and the dunya as a nihaya, they'll be successful. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبُلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Who created death and life. Ibn Abbas said, death is this life. And life is the hereafter. لِيَبُلُوَكُمْ To test you, when is the test going to come for you and me as Muslims? When we see that contradiction. Do I submit to Allah or submit to what's popular? Do I submit to what Allah or do I submit to what I think will give me utility? Do I submit to Allah or do I submit to ease? If I worship Allah as though I see Him, even though I can't see Him, there's never a moral dilemma. Because whether it's good or bad, I'm with Allah. I trust Allah. وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّوا شَيْئًا وَهُوَ الشَّرُّ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُوا وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ The verse says, you hate something is good for you. You love something, probably it's bad for you. And Allah knows you don't know. So the first point that I made is that we need to push into healing. The second point that I made, especially for young people, I'm so happy that I became Muslim when I was 20 so I could memorize the Qur'an and then I could learn the Qira'at and I could do a Shatibiyya when I was young. And Imam Ash-Shatibi from Andalus, from Ishbiliya, from Seville, who wrote Hirz al-Amani, 1,000 lines of poetry on the Qira'at, who was a computer scientist because he used letters, abjad, for the a'imma. Because he couldn't say nafi', warsha nafi', tariq al-azraq. He couldn't write that in the poem so he uses alif, for Nafi, Ba for Qalun if you're from Libya, Jim for Warsh if you're from Morocco. He's a genius. You know what? He was blind. We don't even celebrate him. Look at Helen Keller, man. Sayyidina Imam al-Shatibi kan kafifan. Ma kam yusir. That means he didn't write it. He said it. So you doubt where the Quran can take you and how it can heal you. I cannot encourage you enough if you're young, don't waste your time on the YouTube talk show stuff amongst Muslims. Wallahi, if you're talking about people more than you're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your youth, 
That's a sign. That's a bad sign. It's a bad habit. But focus on the Quran. Focus on the book of Allah. We're talking about being Rabbani. The way to be a Rabbani is to learn the Quran and to have a functional. Don't learn the Quran to be a scholar. Learn the Quran to be an Abid and a Khadim, to be a worshiper and a servant. Wa sahib al harakah. Somebody who's active. Why do I say that? The word Quran, there is a lot of discussion about the origin of the word. If you speak Arabic, it's pretty cool. Alhamdulillah. I'm sure I'm about to say something and someone will say, I never heard that before. That's a good thing. That should happen. But subhanAllah, when we study ilm al you know, the meanings of words. When we study qara'a, we were shocked because we thought qara'a means to read. So the Shaykh, he asked us, when we read uh, Al-Kamal of Al-Mubarrid and Masjid Al-Azhar with Shaykh Abdul Majid from Giza, Rahimahullah, Kan Kabir, Kan Shaykh, Shaykh of the, of the, you know, the wall. You just go to him, open the book. He was a Lughawi. So he said, let's read Al-Mubarrid Al-Kamal. I said, man, I said, I'm in college of Sharia. He said, Sharia, you can be dumb in language? You know, from Giza, a little bit tough, you know. So we read it to him and he said, the meaning of qara is what? We said to recite, he said, no, no, no. The meaning of qara is to bring together. Thalathatu e quru. And that's why, what do you call a village? Don't say Arya if you're from Egypt. What do you call a village? Qarya, because nas what? Yajtami'una fiha. So he said, the Quran is meant to bring you together as one, to make you whole. Just like it brought the letters together and the phrases together and the verses together, the Quran leads to a complete person. And from the Qur'an, you go to what? The Sunnah of Sayyid al-Aqwan. So in this short reminder, number one, it's very important to push into healing. If you're an activist, an imam, a sheikh, or a teacher, and you're hurting, you're going to hurt people. Doesn't mean stop, but you have to take care of yourself. Inna li nafsika alayka al-haq. Your nafs has a right on you. Number two, he said the Qur'an and the Sunnah and Islam in general and Islamic work should heal us in these really powerful ways, intellectually, psychologically, physically, as well as our shahawat, our immorality and our lack of discipline should be shaped by the Qur'an. And then for young people here, because I have two, mashallah, grown ones now. Now I have late a new Firmware update just came around a year ago, but I have some older ones too, alhamdulillah. And I cannot emphasize how I'm thankful that I had a good relationship with my parents, even though they weren't Muslim. And number two, the usra that I was in, which I'm sure you have usra here. But number three, and most important to me, was my relationship with the Quran, especially as a new Muslim. You want to learn Arabic? It's in Quran. You want to learn fiqh? It's in Quran. You want to learn usul? It's in Quran. You want to learn the seerah? It's in the Quran. You want to learn anything? You find it in the Quran. But most importantly, when you're young, you're busy with the book of Allah. So important is that book as I finish. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whoever is too busy, Allah says, who's ever too busy with the Quran to make dua for me, I answer their dua. And when someone came to Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, and they asked him how to draw nearer to Allah, he said, I know no easier way except with his words. So start a process of having a teacher, learning to recite the Quran, memorize some Quran, understand the Quran, and then to put that Quran into practice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in khair. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. As-salamu alaykum.